Donc, je vais parler, I'm going to talk about cryptic genes. Um, and uh, some genes, certain genes, um, also they code for products that are highly conserved, like cytochrome B or cytochrome B, cannot be recognized at the level of the genome. Such genes actually are decoded, are recoded at the level of the various steps of gene expression. So a decoding, recoding takes place either during the transcription from DNA into RNA or when the gene is coding for a protein. Recoding takes place during translation from the messenger RNA into the protein. So most frequent is recoding at the level of the RNA, that is after transcription and prior to translation. So I'll just give you an overview of the talk. I'm first talking about or introducing or reminding you of the structure of ordinary genes and the structure of ordinary mitochondrial genomes. And then I will talk about the quite unusual mitochondrial genes and genomes in diplonemid protists. They are cryptic genes, and I will tell you what we know today, how these genes are decrypted. At the end of the talk, I will briefly um, present you our hypothesis about how all these strange phenomena may have evolved. So here's the structure of ordinary genes. Left, you see the simplest gene structure, which is transcribed into RNA, and then processed at the end and it is immediately a messenger RNA that can be translated. In the middle, you see the gene B. This is interrupted by an intron. It could, can be an intron of the four, uh, one of the four types, a spliceosomal intron, group one, group two intron, or RNA, also called archaeal intron. Again, the um, intron is transcribed together with the exons on both sides in this case, it is spliced, cis spliced to generate a messenger RNA that is continuous and can be translated. On the right side, you see a more rare case. Here, a gene has been broken into two pieces, pro probably by genome rearrangement. In this case, since the part one and part, e, part two is far apart, these uh, two pieces are transcribed independently. And then the splicing machinery, be it group one, group two, spisosomal or tRNA intron splicing machinery, will put together the two axons into a contiguous messenger RNA. So the last case is rare, still it has been observed for all four introns types. So I now I going to remind you about ordinary mitochondrial genomes. So in blue, you will see the typical case, and in brackets, you will see the extremes or deviations. So usually, the mitochondrial genome consists of a single chromosome, and this is the case also in, for our mitochondrial genome. It's one chromosome of about 16 kb. The ploidy is about 10, but can be really, really high, depending even on the state of the cell. The size, let's say on average, is 50 kb. In humans, it's much smaller, and some genomes are more than 10,000 kb. The shape, uh, we, will, we call it circular mapping linear tandem. So it looks circular when you sequence the DNA. It looks circular when you do restriction mapping, but if you would look under the microscope, electron microscope, you would see it's a linear molecule, and so the copies are t tandemly reiterated, looking like circular with these other techniques. They are also truly circular and really linear monomeric genomes as well. Finally, what is the gene number on these mitochondrial genomes? Typically 35. In humans, it's 35, so several protein coding genes and tRNA coding genes and ribosomal RNA genes. There can be as little as five, as many as 100 in the Jacobits. 
So what do these mitochondrial genomes code for? All of them code for components of the electron transport. Some of them, many of them, code for components of ATP synthesis. All of them code for components of protein synthesis, so the ribosomal RNA genes. Then a smaller number of mitochondrial genomes code also for RNA processing components, protein import assembly maturation, and a very few mitochondrial genomes, again those of Jakowitz, would code for a transcription enzymes for RNA polymerase. So the image, the picture shows you the components that are usually encoded by mitochondrial DNA in orange, and the blue ones are those that are contributed by the nuclear genome. So this is the typical kind of mitochondrial DNA in mitochondrial genes and structure. So what we found in diplonemids is all the contrary. Everything is unusual, but you will first ask what are diplonemids? Diplonemids, in fact, are a really little known group, a small group initially. This is, they are flagellates living in the sea. And as to the phylogenetic tree, so this is a tree with the major eukaryotic groups. You would find it here, left at the left top, the diplonemids, sister group of kinetoplastids, including the trypanosomes. And for orientation, at the right bottom corner, this is our place. So what are protists? Protists is a negative definition. Protists are eukaryotes that are neither animals, nor fungi, nor plants. So if you remove the animals, fungi, and plants, not much disappears from the tree. Actually, this makes up a really small part of the diversity of eukaryotes. In other words, protists constitute the big portion of eukaryotic biological diversity. So now the taxon, a few words to the taxon of diplonemids or diplomid, diplonemid, diplonemida. So uh, when you look in old textbooks, you will see it's a tiny group with two recognized genera, the diplonema and the rhynchopus. And in recent years, two more crates have been added by the work of Moreira and Lopez Garcia. But uh, all taxa in these two clades are non-cultured. So um, what we have, we have uh, sequenced and studied for taxa. So, uh, so these diplonemids have been really insignificant so far. But last year, they have moved into the spotlight. Well, so they work the Tara. Uh, ocean expedition, which you might have seen the papers in, in, in Science and Nature, and Science, I think. They surveyed eukaryotes across the world oceans and found that diplonemats are among the most abundant and most species-rich eukaryotes in the sea. So every seventh eukaryote is a diplonemid. So really that changes a lot our perception what diplonemids are. So I will now talk about our research. This is the group who did the work. And so the mitochondrial DNA of diplonemids is in fact really very unusual. So the first paper published about diplonemids appeared in 1999 of the group of Maslow and Simpson, the group of Simpson, Larry Simpson. And they said, Di papillatum mitochondrial DNA is probably composed of several types of circles whose exact size, number, and topolo topological arrangements remain to be investigated. So they found a mass of strange circular molecules, and they were not able to make any sense of, out of it. So this is the point where we started working on it. And it takes us quite a number of years to figure out what's going on. And I will make the story, which was long, I will make it very short. So we stepped in with the PhD um, work project of William Marant, who, um, whose uh, photo you see here. He is now here working in Paris. So after several years of, 
of groping in the dark, we finally found out that diplonamids have about 100 different distinct types of chromosomes in the mitochondria. So there are two size classes, 6KB and 7KB circles. And most of the sequence of these circles is repeats and only about 500 nucleotides, 500 bases, is unique sequence. And we asked really, where are the genes? We have been sequencing about 20 KB in the beginning and we didn't see a single gene. So in the end, what turned out is all the genes in the mitochondrial genome of diplonamids are in small pieces. They are all broken up into what we call modules of a length between 60 and 350 nucleotides. Some genes have 11 modules, others have 10, 9, or 8. And the most astonishing thing is there is each chromosome carries one single module, one single piece of a gene. So these, obviously, these gene pieces have to be transcribed independently, separately, and only then are they joined together in a process what we call transplicing. So you see in, this, in the images up in the upper part, chromosomes, six chromosomes with M1 to M6, meaning module 1 to M6, and this corresponds to one gene. Then you have transcription with precursor transcripts having, including sequence from the non-coding uh, regions. These transcripts are processed uh, on both ends to yield coding sequence only. Again, six pieces, coding sequence only. And these pieces are then put together into a contiguous messenger RNA. This can be translated into protein. But when we looked more carefully, it's not just transplicing that is going on. There is also RNA editing in certain genes. For example, COX-1, which specifies cytochrome oxidase subunit 1, has six U's inserted between modules 4 and 5. And the way how it's inserted is actually not inserted. It is the six U's are appended prior to transplicing of module four and five. So we call this U appendage editing because the U's are added and are not truly inserted. And uh, these added U's um, are really important in order to fill in amino acids that would be missing otherwise. So here uh, I, I show you a table of the genes that we have found. It's actually the gene count of last year. So there are 11 typical mitochondrial genes, all in pieces. You see here uh, in the third column the number of modules per gene, starting with ATP63 and NAD5 having 11 modules. And we, so the genes are coding for ADP synthase and cytochrome B, ADP cytochrome B, COX, cytochrome C oxidase subunits and NADDH dehydrogenase subunits, the large ribosomal RNA and the small ribosomal RNA which is present in all mitochondrial genomes known today was missing at that time. So we said this is not possible. Apparently we have overlooked this gene. So we started seriously looking after this missing gene and the story that follows now is how we finally discovered it. So there were a number of unrecognized modules, modules uh, actually 17 at the time where we didn't know where they belong to, what to which gene they belong and how they belong to each other. So which is which of these modules belong to a, a given gene and what are they coding for? And so the main question was which of those uh, is our missing small ribosomal RNA gene. So we did a really large scale um, sequencing and transcriptome analysis and proteomics and everything um, to be sure that we don't overlook this gene that we were after. And in the end, what turned out is the module called X3 is actually the mitochondrial ribosomal RNA. We are pretty sure about that. And how we did we find it? It is highly abundant in RNA-seq libraries. 
um, first of all, and then we isolated mito ribosomes, and there it was even more abundant. So that was a, a, good, a good indication that it's a ribosomal RNA. So we can fold it. If you are really, really working hard, you can fold it into a domain that is present in all small subunit RNA um, uh, molecules seen so far. We call it still tentative, and especially Mike Gray, who has helped, it, helped us with folding, he said, yeah, it, it could, it's probably mitochondrial small ribosomal RNA, but there are certain things that are not so orthodox, and this is that many of these canon canonical domains are missing, and it's very short. Uh, it is actually the shortest small ribosomal RNA gene reported so far. However, if you look at the animal mitochondrial ribosomal, small ribosomal RNAs, it's not that much smaller, perhaps 50 nucleotides smaller. So we looked more carefully at this uh, gene, and then we saw, looking at the RNA sec data, that there is U appendage editing also going on at the end, at the very end of, of the molecule of the RNA. But then we saw that there's also substitution editing going on. Actually, it is a stretch of about 90 nucleotides where every C is substituted by an U in the RNA, and half of the A's are substituted by Gs in the cDNA sequence. So this was the first case of substitution editing that we have seen in this genome. And you can imagine that finding genes in the genome in this case is, is really, really very hard. So we were most interested in this kind of substitution editing. What kind of substitution editing is it? So we see cytidine to uridine, adenosine to guanosine. Well, this reminds us very much of deamination RNA editing. So it would be cited into uridine, adenine to inosine, because the Gs in the cDNA sequence occur as, as, uh, as the, the inosines in RNA occur like Gs in the cDNA sequence. So the, when you remove the amino group of cytidine, you get a uridine. If you remove the amino group of adenosine, you obtain an inosine. And so we also demonstrated experimentally that the small ribosomal RNA has, in fact, inosines uh, incorporated. The question is a little bit, um, what, what happens when inosines are ribosomal RNA? So it's the first case that of a ribosomal RNA having inosines. Uh, inosines, they do pair with many other nucleotides, not just with uh, so G, uh, G with C, but they would pair with other nucleotides, so this would probably we weaken the stability of the molecule, and it would also might give rise to, very alter to lots of alternative structures. So that would be interesting to look at in more detail what happens with the inosines and what the inosines do to the ribosomal RNA. Yeah, and as I said, so A to I editing, what we found in diplonema is the first A to I editing in mitochondria, uh, except uh, tRNAs, and the first case of uh, inosines in ribosomal RNA. So to summarize a little bit what we found so far as to RNA editing sites, so um, three quarter of the genes are edited in one way or another, so the most edited as to substitution editing is the small ribosomal RNA gene. And the most edited as to U appendage editing is a gene whose nature we do not know so far. There are three sites of U appendage uh, of 2716 and one nucleotide. So a question occurs, obviously, uh, there are 80 modules, 100 editing sites, so how the cell knows, the mitochondria knows which modules to join and which sites to edit. We have not seen any problems, any, any errors at that level. We have searched for signals at the sequence level and at the 2D structure motif, but there are no signals 
that resemble those signals of, spy of known introns, and there are also no signals around RNA editing sites. So our hypothesis is there are not cis elements, there are trans factors that specify the places where these changes take place. And we have uh, essentially two hypotheses what it could be. Either it's an RNA factor that binds to the modules that have been transplaced and to be edited, substitution edited or appended edited, or alternatively, these could be also protein. Proteins doing exactly the same job. And this is what we are currently investigating in our lab. We would like to know the factors and the machineries that are doing all these steps. So a summary of our finding is we found systematically fragmented genes, separate transcription of the gene pieces, a novel type of transplicing, and view appendage RNA editing with denomination. So gene description, gene encryption in this organism is by via dispersed fragmentation of genes, via deletions and substitutions, and in addition to very divergent gene sequences. So let me go to the last question. Uh, the big question is always evolutionary questions. Why such wastefully complicated gene organization and expression. So one hypothesis would be adaptive evolution towards increased fitness, but that appears really unlikely since the convoluted gene expression machinery needs lots of resources. Another hypothesis is comp compensation, the compensation th theory of a detrimental event. However, the problem of this theory is how would the cell survive once the accident has happened, it cannot wait millions of years to evolve a machinery that fixes the problem. So we do favor the theory of constructive neutral evolution, which indicates that the solution was already in place when the accident happened. So for example, there were pre-existing enzymes that could do a little bit of editing and a little bit of joining and that were then optimized during evolution to do a, a good job. So the outlook, our working hypothesis is that there is evolution by tinkering, that the new mitochondrial functions we have seen in mitochondria of diplomnemids have been recruited from elsewhere, so either from the nucleus or by horizontal transfer from phages or from viruses. And our approach is to dissect the machineries with biochemical methods to track down where the components all come from and um, to, this will allow us then to find out from which basic machineries all these parts have evolved. So our current work aims at the experimental identification of the editosome and the joinosomes and their parts. So once we know these components, we can make hypotheses about their origin. So this is the end of my talk. I'd like to mention collaborators and funding. So the four, four first people have participated in the work I have presented today. There are a number of students, uh, internship students, also coming from France that helped in this work. And then my collaborators, long-term collaborators, Michael Gray, Franz Lang, Julius Lucas, and Marcel Turcotte, who is a computer scientist. Thank you for your attention. Y a-t-il une ou deux questions courtes et on pourra ensuite rapporter à la discussion sur ce, euh, cet exposé euh, Oui. So, uh, it's probably not a very likely hypothesis, but uh, what if this uh, organization with split genes that are transplaced would be ancestral somehow <laughs> Well, um, if you look at the phylogenetic tree, diplonemids are a long tree, a long, a long branch, so it is rather really de de derived uh, a feature. And we are now trying to find species that are less derived, that are more at the basis of when these funny uh, 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 breaking up of genes emerged. Um, we have not yet found it, but we are still continuing, and I, I'm sure we will find intermediates where there is only a little bit of gene breakup and that it has really 
evolved and um, been optimized in the diplomats. Oui. The uh, ribosomal RNA story is absolutely unbelievable. I think it's an extremum in uh, natural life. Nothing like that anywhere happens. Uh, especially the deamination, because the step of having to know in some enzyme what is the actual structure, even from the point of view of the, of the dogma, it's an unbelievable story, because some enzyme has to know which sequence is correct, and it is in the protein somehow, which is unprecedented, yeah. because everything in translation is always templated by nucleic acid. So it's an exception that is truly, a, mm. I'm under shock, right? <laughs> I have, I have, I have a, a question about tRNAs. How about tRNAs? They are imported? tRNAs are yeah, encoded in the nucleus, imported into the mitochondrion, which is the case also in the sister group, kinetoplastis, and mm. in the euglenids that are the basis of the tree. What's the size of the, chromo of the genome, nuclear genome of this? Uh, of the nuclear genome is 75 uh, megabases about. So it's small? It's relatively small, yeah. Do they starve for something that you know? Pardon? Do they starve these cells in their natural ecosystems? Like, would they be starved for phosphorus? You know, so there would be a fantastic pressure for saving phosphorus or uh, nitrogen or something. Like that. You right. see that, for instance, marine organisms have smaller RNAs because they lack phosphorus. Oh, that is odd. that is what you mean. Yeah. They, they have not enough to eat. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Well, we have to <laughs> grow them on horse serum. And in nature, they certainly do not have horse, horse serum yeah, to grow on. Right. So mm. I think in the sea, there yeah. is very little of the things uh, yeah. they would need. Mm. Okay. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Tu as eu une question là, oui, euh, Henri, rapidement, et puis après on arrête. Uh, where are the gene corresponding to the enzyme catalyzing all these reactions encode? In the mitochondria or in the host? Well, I expect the genes to be in the nucleus because we have essentially found all genes. The Y genes, we, know, we don't know what they do, but they look more like membrane proteins because they are very apolar. I don't think that these have catalytic activity, for sure not, not the catalyst, the activity, the deamination also. 